anonymous. Um, and I just want to uh, welcome everybody and give a short introduction before I hand this over to Thaisa. So thank you for joining us this evening for the first of four conversations that were organized by the faculty teaching in the City College of New York's Graduate Landscape Architecture Program. Some years ago, Erica Svensson and Lindsay Campbell, research social scientists at the USDA Forest Services New York Urban Field Station, helped me develop our ecology curriculum into a team taught exploration of urban systems interacted with human communities, non human biota, and all of the intertwined phenomena and processes that we generalize as the environment. As they continued on to instruct in our program, joined by Andrea Parker, Executive Director of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy, we had conversations about what we were doing, combining geography, anthropology, human ecology, biology, history, and community engagement under this one umbrella of ecology. It was frankly a response to our students who cope with climate anxiety and economic stress as they look for a foothold from which to launch new approaches and ideas for changing the complex world they will inherit. The grounding they seek must span politics and ecology, social and biological, so they can generate transdisciplinary conversation across multiple scientific disciplines, design practitioners, and a diverse public. No ecology textbook identifies rules or best practices for how to negotiate territories inhabited by non-human biota and complex human communities with crossing economic and class strata, overlapping gender, racial, and spiritual identities to complement but also compete with each other for rights and means to perpetuate their needs and desires. So we've chosen to open a conversation about what we designers and humans need to know and how to teach it. Tonight, this is no show and tell. Speakers will present a zombie idea or theory that one of their projects can test through its design or approach to planning or projective research and analysis. And I want to thank all of the speakers and the moderator, Thaisa Way, for fearlessly participating in our conversation. You can find all of the bios online, so we're not going to fill time here recounting them. But briefly, I want to say that we turned to Thaisa to moderate these first two conversations because the scope of her understanding from writing landscape histories inclusive of practitioners overlooked when the canon was compiled by mainly male historians to thoughts on planning alternative hydrologic infrastructure in the Pacific Northwest, to writing and editing on climate adaptive urbanism. She reflects the, the range of understandings we need to bring together today. And lastly, she has what may be the most important character trait a sense of humor. So thank you again, Thaisa, and welcome to everyone logged on. Thank you, Denise. Um, and I'll try to be funny at some point. Um, no, it's it's really a delight. And and I have to say, as I'm listening to these bells um, go on, it's really fantastic to see the enthusiasm for this conversation. And I think in many ways, this year, this moment, this month, this fall, there couldn't be a more important conversation, which are not just what are the zombie ideas out there, but really how are we gonna change what we know? Not only do what do we need to know, but how are we gonna change what we know and change what we teach? And to change what we know actually is, is much harder than I think many of us imagine. It, it actually means retraining the way we think, the kinds of questions we ask, the kinds of research we do, um, and the people we interact with and, and engage in conversation with. And so I am really thrilled and honored to be part of a set of conversations that thinks about what kinds of risks we can take um, in order to change knowledge, to change that body of knowledge and to change practice. And I should be clear that when I think about knowledge, I think of it as knowledge in the more traditional, the kinds of things we think we know and when we know what we don't know, um, but also knowledge and practice. What, what are the things that you do in practice because you think you know that that's the practice that, that leads to wherever you're going? Um, and, and I might suggest that latter type of practice is something we don't reflect on enough. We don't think about why, what is it we think we know when we practice in a certain way? Um, and so I think this conversation is really important, but I know we wanna really hear from our four speakers as Denise noted, 
Um, we're not going to introduce them per se. I think um, you can look their bio up, but I think what's more important uh, right now is the idea that they're presenting um, and then our conversation afterwards. So I should give you a couple rules uh, just so you know um, what, what you're about to hear. We're going to have four speakers, four ideas. Uh, they have exactly 10 minutes. Um, so I am, you know, I'll, I'll be a little polite for about 10 seconds um, and then I'll cut them off. Um, so we really are going to keep to 10 minutes. And, and then we're going to have a conversation amongst them because I think, one, as I said before, I think one of the ways we change the way we think is to engage in different discourses. And then we're going to open up and I'll moderate a conversation with all of you. So as you're going along, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat and I will do my best to keep an eye on that um, and bring it forward. And if all works out, actually, I hope that we can have some of you um, also present your own question. We'll just sort of see how time goes and how many questions, et cetera. I'll figure that out on the fly, as it were. Um, I suppose I can't make any more fly jokes. Um, so I think with that, um, I'm going to turn to Andrea Johnson, Everyday Energy Ecologies, and you can turn it over, you can share your screen if you want, um, or just begin, Andrea. And if I could ask everyone to make sure they mute themselves while others are speaking. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, this is an exciting opportunity. I've been working on uh, this project with um, a fellowship with the Landscape Architecture Foundation for the past few months. Um, originally, my proposal was to investigate how landscape design could reinforce community movements that are working towards social and economic justice via the construction of energy networks. I quickly discovered I had to understand the solar networks within the larger ecology of electricity. When asked to present a zombie idea, I realized I was dealing with a zombie infrastructure, one which originated on a few blocks in lower Manhattan and has since evolved alongside our social values and ambitions into what's called the biggest machine on earth. Transmission lines may easily be replaced, but the grid as a cultural artifact sustaining the ideal of centralized control and ownership is far less malleable. Recent state and city legislation, however, does seek to disrupt the status quo with goals such as developing 6,000 megawatts of uh, distributed solar PV, including uh, significant investment in environmental justice communities that have been at the forefront of advocating for these changes for decades. My research is focusing on the potential synergies between distributed generation and the recent Department of Environmental Conservation law limiting nitrogen oxide emissions at existing power plants. Although distributed solar will account for less than 5% of the state's idealized energy portfolio, it's a critical asset when about 80% of our peak demand must originate from within the city because of transmission constraints importing power. Scaling up distributed generation would mitigate the impacts of the highest polluting peaker plants. Recent national reports reveal a causal link between particulate matter and COVID-19 fatality rates, which is reflected here in the local context. Despite state investment in distributed energy resources, the challenge is how to integrate it into the existing grid, which was built for one-way flows of large quantity of gas, coal, and oil. Beyond the physical infrastructure lies a complex multi-jurisdictional regulatory environment. The Federal Regulatory Commission, for example, has recently rejected New York's proposal to restructure its capacity markets to allow renewables to compete against fossil fuel power plants because receiving a New York state subsidy disqualifies them. With more investment in large scale renewables and scattered distributed energy resources like solar panels and batteries, overwhelmingly the response has been to match this heterogeneity of parts with more complex net metering and ancillary markets. As shown here, all of these services are provided at the transmission level node, which concentrates power and control at the top. Shifting some of that responsibility to di distribution hubs would grant more decision-making powers to local authorities. Shown here are the DSO nodes, which, which would operate as microgrids that could be disconnected from the central grid during power outages. This is unrealistic, but the concept of the microgrid extends all the way down to a collection of buildings with solar panels and a shared battery. Planning for energy has usually occurred at the scale of the utility and the individual household. 
therefore benefiting wealthier homeowners when low-income tenement tenants pay up to 13% of their income on electricity. Increasingly in the US, there are an array of so-called community and shared solar models, although they tend to leave out low income and communities of color. They range from community aggregated choice where the municipality procures power on behalf of residents to subscription models where you own a panel that is located on a solar farm nearby. In all of these models, residents are still receiving transmission and distribution services from their existing utility. Three models in New York City elucidate the challenges of bringing community solar grounded in social and environmental justice to scale. First is Uprose, who is in the midst of developing a cooperatively owned solar facility on the Brooklyn Army Terminal roof. However, for something like this to be replicable, the city would need to better systematize access to public real estate assets. WEAC's Uptown Solar Network brought together affordable co-op buildings to purchase solar as a group. It's strategic to collectively target subsidized housing developments like these or something like Nehemiah in East New York or NYCHA buildings because they are comparable in height. The uncertainty of, a, of adjacent development makes investment in, un, in solar unpredictable. Brooklyn Microgrid connects small scale producers and consumers together into virtual power plants allowing households to trade energy with one another, um, avoiding the involvement of any central clearinghouse along the lines of the traditional utility. Each of these scenarios give participants more financial control of energy, yet they're spatially equivalent in that there's no redundancy built into the, into the networks due to city codes, battery costs, and interconnection challenges when you start to couple shared technologies. Variability in peak demand will increase in the winter and summer months as we electrify the building and transportation sector and, plan and planning for the dynamic temporal ranges of renewable energy becomes more critical. However, currently as demand and generation are scheduled at the transmission level, there is a disconnect between envisioning the role of distributed energy resources when it comes to the city's plans to bring the, the 16 peak or power plants into compliance with the new nitrogen oxide regulations. These aging plants rely primarily on oil and gas and they're designed to switch on quickly and produce extra capacity when the city's demands exceed the regular supply, like during a heat wave. Peaker plants are more likely to operate on days when ozone levels are high and air quality is already poor, exacerbating their impact. A report put out by the Peaker Coalition found that these companies receive enormous sums because they are paid for the capacity they provide, not the power they produce. Adding a, six, a 316 megawatt battery to Ravenswood, the largest of the peakers, is a plan that is already moving forward. It's a step in the right direction, but the advantage of the battery is its ability to store intermittent energy rather than off-peak natural gas. A report by Nisurda found that the peak load for all of the plants could be offset by a combination of batteries and storage. However, the current DEC law mandates all infrastructure to be sited within a half mile of the plant, emulating the centralized supply model. Using the story of plants as a case study and trying to fit those three megawatts of solar or 12 acres within the half mile radius, brings up a lot of questions related to how this fits within the city's coastal development plans, questions of ownership, interconnection, how the phasing out of toxic but extremely stable fuel might be replaced by a system that is far more uncertain and unstable, but has a benefit to spread, its, uh, to spread the benefits much more widely. Several months into this research, I'm beginning to understand what the zombie is, and I'm looking forward to, to the conversation and feedback. Thank you. Thank you. I think that I thought, was pretty quick. That, that was eight minutes. So far, you win the prize. <laughs> um, all right, you guys, the, the, the competition is on. No, Amy, Amy Lerner, you are next. Hi. Um, so I should share my screen, correct? Okay. You see it there, the green box at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. 
Perfect. And if you just go on presenter, we'll see just your big slide. Perfect. Okay. Um, thanks so much for inviting me, Denise. It's great to see uh, some colleagues of my past. Um, and, uh, and I'm happy to share a bit about what I've been thinking about, which I didn't realize is a zombie idea until Denise prompted me. And so it's been fun to think about what this idea is. Um, I'm in the midst of a transition from being at the National Autonomous University of Mexico to UC San Diego. So my interests might be shifting a bit, but this is this concept that I've been thinking about. Um, I conjured back to 2004 when I'd moved to New England and when I was motivated to get involved with the conservation community, being a conservationist, uh, at least I thought so at the time. Um, a friend invited me to a conservationist group who volunteered on weekends to eradicate invasive plants from restored or recovered ecosystems, namely forests. That day we donned gloves and pickaxes to dig up Japanese barberry, some of you might be familiar, um, a common ornamental that has become a weedy invasive in northeastern forests. As I wiped the sweat from my brow on a cold winter day, I couldn't help but wonder, wow, this is a lot of work. Is this necessary? How bad could it be? The small group of us made, made our way along rock walls, picking and digging away. Needless to say, I did not return with the invasive plant eradicators. Um, something didn't feel right to me. Maybe it seemed like this plant had passed the point of no return and this effort wasn't worth it. What could a group of nine volunteers on Saturdays really accomplish? This was not the first time that I'd been, become involved in invasive species eradication campaigns. From South America to Australia, any time I took an ecology course, we ended up digging up entrenched roots. While reflecting on these experiences for this discussion, I decided to look up the more current debates about invasive species. Lo and behold, I was not the only one to have been put off by the messianic nature of invasive plant removal. In 2011, a group of biologists published an article in Nature that caused a complete uproar called Don't Judge a Species by Its Origin, which argued that the emphasis on species nativeness in the environmental management community was counterproductive, they used the term counterproductive, and damaging. It of course led to fervent debates within the conservationist community whether the concern over invasive species and nativeness was warranted. Critical geographers Paul Robbins and Sarah Moore refer to this sort of tension or contradictory condition as ecological anxiety disorder. I love that term. I thought of Denise when I heard that term, ecological anxiety disorder. I won't go into too much detail on this point, but I recommend their article from 2013 when they present their argument on embracing novelty, which is a bit where I'm headed with this. Needless to say, Leslie Head provides a very interesting summary of this whole thing in her article called The Social Dimensions of Invasive Plants, um, which is precisely what I was reflecting upon as someone who has moved from ecology to social science. Um, and this was published in 2017 in Nature Plants, which presents a synopsis of the debates and reviews the divergence in the natural and social sciences and the language used regarding terms such as native, exotic, invasive, alien, amongst others. In particular, the social sciences understand, and she uses this direct language, that concepts and discourses have power and are not just objective terms to describe biophysical realities as much as the environmental management community would like to think they do. The separation of species into what belongs and what must go has become funda fundamentally part of environmental management. Um, in, in the article I mentioned, she uses the case of the Australian acacia and goes through the different perceptions and practices that have been associated with the acacia as an example, which I found really interesting moving from the concept of improving nature um, to sustainable development um, to an objective science perspective of seeing it as invasive. So the same plant can be seen in different ways 
depending on uh, the, the sort of world of perceptions and narratives that we hold. Um, the separation of species has also become fundamentally part of urban policy and planning. Common throughout the urban world and especially the urban world of the global south are the terms informal, irregular, illegal, often referred to as slums. A third of the global urban population lives under these conditions, a third of the global urban population. These invasive, invasive settlements are a housing solution to those left out of formal markets for economic and other socio-political reasons and who arrive to cities not only because of the pull of cities, which is the most common story, but also as Mike Davis reminds us in Planet of Slums, because of the push factors in the countryside, land grabbing, lack of support for farmers in the face of industrialized and globalized agriculture amongst others. One of the, more, the most traditional solutions has been to raise or eradicate slums, much like my session with the Japanese barberry. My students at UNAM in Mexico City have been looking into some of the discourses or mental models around hydrological risk in Mexico City and particularly how it relates to informality. Mexico City is an interesting case because it has 56% of its land area and protected conservation area, which is this, um, to recharge the aquifer and provide a myriad of ecosystem services, but for several reasons has also been home to encroaching and formal urban growth over the past 30 years. Approximately 15% of Mexico City residents do not have regular access to water and most of this issue is related to land tenure. Although they cannot receive services since they are illegal, they also have a constitutional right to water, which means that trucks deliver just enough water to residents who are not able to connect formally to the grid. And the red lines show where there's the most amount of informal settlements, which are within the conservation zone. One of my graduate students, Berta Hernandez, has been looking at discourses and the solutions for water scarcity and informal settlements. What we present in this first image is the idea that mental models or ways that we understand the relationship between processes in the world and causality determine the actions of actors and the framing of problems and their solutions in particular institutions. Berta, for example, found that the solution most mentioned in her interviews with local residents and officials from the city government is formalizing settlements. But this mostly comes from the local government who prefers this option so that the city government becomes responsible instead of the local government. Residents do not see formalization, getting title to land as a possible solution giving the required bureaucracy. They just want a bit more water to continue as they are. We refer to this as enhancing informality. Informality in Mexico City and other cities in the world is the white elephant in the city government building. There are actors gaining from the situation, for example, votes for particular political parties, and it's pretty unpopular to remove them. So billions of people all over the world are living in limbo with the pressing possibility of their settlements being raised. Do they have the right to be there? What is the solution to the issue? Um, and here we see the, the favoring of, of formalization that's within the local government and their in interviews with them about the problem. Concepts and discourses have power. What if people were not illegal or informal? What if there are possibilities for participatory settlement upgrading or community titling, which are actually initiatives that are taking place in different parts of the world? What if there is an innovative zoning process to allow for different types of settlements in and around cities? What if we weren't so obsessed with who and what belongs where? I do understand the implications of invasive species as plainly observed in the background. Everybody here knows what this is. As I am cognizant of the potential impacts of urbanizing the conservation land of Mexico City, although there is a whole other discussion of real environmental impact of informal settlements. However, as cities expand, the informality will follow. It's important to reflect on our framings of who is allowed to be and where. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. Sierra, Hello. it's all yours. All right. Uh, share. And make it big. Hi. Thanks, everybody. And um, so excited to read everyone's 
um, thoughts for today and hope that this is helpful and interesting as a compliment. <clears throat> um, coming from a, pro a project and practice background, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, one in which we learned or I learned about our um, discipline-wide predilection to approach sites and particularly planting from the standpoint of ecology. And I think, you know, to um, uh, our, the, our previous presenter, um, especially native plantings, um, and that's kind of the default as we come to projects. And I, the zombie or, or what I would like to argue is that ecology and culture are, are actually not mutually exclusive, although many of our projects would make them seem to be so. Um, and I also wanted to think about the idea that we are bodies and our, uh, our, we're animals and our bodies are a way to help us access a more nuanced understanding of our landscape and our culture. And that sensory intake is a way to access memory and thus our personal and cultural stories and relationships to our landscapes and our ecologies. This was really brought home in this Kind of, this is a, a pre-project, <laughs> not the main case. Um, but as we were working on the Women's History Museum in Zambia with a community that was the first in our 10 years of working on Afri in Africa that identified itself as an indigenous community. And Mulenga and Samba, the co-founders, um, are arguing and, and wanting to create a museum to um, decolonize the idea that uh, ecology is something other than their own personal culture. And with the understanding that the writing of their culture is their personal history on the body, it is not on paper. It's a history that is oral and has stayed with her because the senses are attached to memory. And we understood through this project as well that the sense is the channel by which we observe itself in the outside world. And that there are not only five, there are 14 senses by which we can understand and interpret the world around us. In fact, the body is ecology or an integral part of ecology. And it's something that we, uh, that we found as a way to use and think about how do we embed ourselves in that in a more specific way. I wanna also acknowledge uh, my partners in this, Jeff Mansfield, Maura Rockcastle, and uh, Jadi Williams, who are all a part of thinking through how we get to a more specific understanding of the landscape that is not only ecological, but also cultural. Um, the story is of uh, the Kendall Division II Memorial School at Gallaudet University, which was a segregated school within the university, <clears throat> which had 23 students. Um, and Louise B. Miller um, was the mother of one of the students who fought to have that school desegregated from the campus on in which it was um, a part. Uh, and this, this happened as a precursor to Brown versus Board of Education. And so it was one of the cases that laid the groundwork for desegregation across the country. And this idea of the ramble the, and, and uh, the thought that this is not a straight line, the walk for freedom is um, something that is circuitous. And this came actually from conversations with um, the core uh, group of partners that we were working with of black deaf um, students and uh, uh, members of the university at, uh, campus. Um, and starting with that, you know, we were beginning to think about design and, and realize that we had no idea and no way of understanding um, what would the palette be for such a place that was specifically for a black deaf community. Uh, and this, I think, started to dawn on me also through the work on EJI Memorial um, and an and, and inability there to actually access the community and begin to ask these questions of what is the landscape of your, your culture? What is the landscape of your community? <clears throat> and so really felt the need to do so and make sure that that was part of our conversation here. And so to get there, we tried to ask questions that simulated the sensory, which would make sense for a deaf community and also use memory as a relationship to that sensory um, um, uh, aspect by asking simple questions of what are the places in your childhood where you felt comfort? What did they feel like? What did they smell like? What was the light? 
What outdoor spaces do you associate with having a good time with your family or friends? What are the qualities of the spaces that make them enjoyable to be in? And then what is black space? <clears throat> black deaf space look, feel, and smell like to you? What are the materials and textures and spatial uh, characteristics? And, and then specifically about this memorial, what, what if we think about deprivation, which if we look at the existing building, um, especially in relationship to the campus was, which was this amazing uh, 18th, uh, 19th century uh, Victorian, beautiful campus with amazing texture and, um, and color. And you know the the three the small building of the Kendall School was completely devoid of any texture or um, uh, adornment and was a kind of 1960s uh, very typical building. And so the thought is, what is the opposite of that deprivation of of sense, um, visual and otherwise? And how can we think about abundance? And then, you know, trying to create images to kind of create access and, and help us to understand um, which of these are more stimulating and in what ways and what are most appropriate for different types of space within this um, outdoor garden and memorial. And as well, the material stories. And through that, through this conversation and the amazing answers that we heard, we heard about stories of um, families who would go to Rock Creek Park in DC on the weekends on Sundays and just spend time walking around in this natural environment um, and, uh, and, and other stories as well. We began to understand a palette potentially that could, could provide uh, the background for this, um, uh, for this memorial. And how do we think about deprivation and abundance across language, senses, community, culture, identity, freedom, memory, and love. And from that, Understanding Black Deaf space is a space to commiserate, share stories, come together, a place to move that doesn't oppress, that Black signing is actually takes up more space than typical signing, and as well a space for grace. <clears throat> and, a, and a kind of array of other um, conditions and experiential goals that we kind of attempted to access through thinking about the body and, and, and relating that to a, a particular culture of this community. And then how do we distribute that through these sensory rooms along this freedom path and into the memorial of Louise Miller and the 23 students. And I'm going to move through these uh, um, fairly quickly, but, you know, also realizing that Gallaudet actually, you know, has many kind of native plantings. It doesn't have any actual space for people, deaf or black, uh, deaf or deaf. Um, there are a few like outdoor patios, but there are really no outdoor landscapes, gardens or places to um, to be outside in a, in a comfortable way. And, and for sure there were no black deaf landscapes. And so we kind of developed this project to um, distribute these sensory rooms to create things that are based not only on black deaf space, which is about how do we make sure that we're sitting in a circular manner so that we can see everyone signing in a group, that our paths are wide enough for people to walk with multiple people abreast of each other so that there's enough room to sign while you're moving. Um, and that also there's a place for gathering where you can have height and everyone can see the person who's signing in front alongside some of the other information that we gotten. And then when we come into the memorial, um, three particular sensory rooms dedicated to Louise um, and the students. And the footprint being here, a place of calm where the palette, the visual palette mellows itself, but is then also activated in a really beautiful way by a scrim of water um, that can change and that those spaces might have a different relationship to that water as you move through them. Uh, and, and that also this idea that especially, you know, with multiple of the communities and cultures in our United States, there is a sublimation of history. And this is a project about bringing that history forward. Uh, and so the water also is, has this pattern of receding um, at times and, and not being there, revealing the names of the 23 students and other aspects of this history. Um, and then at times being flooded um, and reminding us of the need uh, or the, that, that potential and, and tendency towards sublimation of, of certain histories and the need to kind of always work to bring those forward. Thank you. Thank you. Lindsay. Perfect. 
Okay, great. Hi, folks. Thanks for having me and joining on the evening. Uh, I'm a research social scientist with the USDA Forest Service. And the concept that I'm pushing up against in this talk is ecosystem services. So yes, there's been a robust uptake by policymakers and practitioners focused on sustainability and natural resource management, including right here in New York City as part of the city's sustainability plan. And yes, forest service scientists and models have shaped whole domains in this sphere, such as the iTree software suite that assigns dollar values to tree benefits, and yes, I have engaged with and written about this myself. For example, I've researched the uses, values, and meanings of New York City parkland and have framed these as cultural ecosystem services. But I've always found this framing insufficient. I think ecosystem services have many pitfalls and shortcomings. Uh, quantification and especially commodification simplifies, misses, and erases the complexity of lived experience. It misses that services are co-produced, shaped, and guided by people, power dynamics, and politics. And in trying to value ecosystem services, we often miss the broad suite of intrinsic, instrumental, and relational values related to, na to nature. And finally, ecosystem services very poorly captures the spiritual and cultural domains, which can teach us so much about why and how we care for ecosystems, landscapes, and places. Instead, I think we need to restory urban ecosystems to understand and build relations of care. So I'll unpack these two concepts of care and stories and why I think they have relevance to the field of natural resources management in which I work. So focus on care is not new. Feminist theorists and artists like Merle Adam and Eucles have put this at the center of their work for decades acknowledging the importance of ongoing care work, often done by women whose labor is undervalued, unvalued, or even unseen. I aim to build upon this by surfacing not only the labor involved, but also the love and the ethic that can serve as a wellspring for creativity and meaning making. Environmental scholars have identified care, along with knowledge and agency, as being the three conceptual underpinnings that drive and characterize environmental stewardship and draw particular attention to the need to better understand and engage with the care dimension as a potential pathway towards more sustainable outcomes. So by centering on care in our work on local environmental stewardship, we can surface and amplify the sometimes less seen, but albeit crucial everyday practices of residents, civic leaders, and public servants in shaping and caring for places, communities, and ecosystems. And through sharing stories, we can both learn from multiple epistemologies and worldviews and find different ways to understand and envision alternative futures. So storytelling from personal stories to origin stories to sacred texts provides a cross-cultural means for sharing experience, life ways, and ways of knowing. And my colleague, Heather McMillan, who'll speak on a later panel has informed my thinking on the importance of learning from indigenous knowledge and local ecological knowledge, not only positivist science, as we aim to support biocultural stewardship approaches. So change the story and you change the city, state Goldstein et al. They focus on practices of collective storytelling that can help shape planning trajectories because these can be an alternative way to envision new futures. So these photos show an example of a participatory exercise our research team developed with artist Carmen Bouillet. It came out of necessity. We were tabling about our stewardship survey at community events with very little enthusiasm for the work because all we had was a drab flyer. We were doing the typical one-way community outreach of talking at people and trying to recruit them to our work instead of starting by listening to and learning from them. And we found that we needed a different way to engage people in why stewardship matters by asking them to share a story of a time and a place in which they cared for the local environment and put it on the map. We've run this exercise with everyone from third graders to global professionals at an FAO World Forestry Congress, and we've always found that it reveals the heart and soul of stewardship as care and connection to people and place. So my colleagues at the Forest Service and I, particularly Erica Svensson, have been researching civic stewardship for the past 18 years, and our signature project is called StuMap, a decadal survey where we identify and map all the civic stewardship groups in the city. We've sought out new modes for understanding, visualizing, and supporting those stewards that go beyond peer-reviewed publications or databases to bring these stories to life. And last September, we mounted the exhibition, Who Takes Care of New York at the Queens Museum Community Partnership Gallery. Itself, a unique space set up to invite non-museum folks to curate shows that bridge the worlds of arts and culture and community engagement. 
and we created a transdisciplinary space where artists, scientists, and stewards made new knowledge together, including two of our existing artists in residence and two artists identified through a call for Queens Connected Artists. And overall, we aimed to empower visitors to the exhibition with an understanding of their capacity to make lasting change in their neighborhoods. So to do that, we start by amplifying the voices and actions of stewards themselves as agents of change. We aim to share the stories, faces, territories, and actions of a diverse range of folks involved in creating and transforming the local environment. And we put them on a large scale map shown here that covered one wall of the exhibition space. Alongside that, we invited the public to add their own stories to an online map set up at a kiosk, which we've preserved as a digital story map. Where and how do these acts of care happen in our urban environment? Artist Matthew Jensen trains his eye on the street tree, this form of nearby nature that is for so many New Yorkers their first entry point into stewardship action. Jensen's project recognizes a diversity of care practices from homemade tree guards to ornate gardens, and through his process of researching and documenting, he participates in his own forms of tree stewardship, including by becoming a citizen pruner. How can we understand the collect both the collective impact and individual experiences of thousands of stewards? Magali Desant's work explores the knowledge, practices, and actions of stewards in Queens, New York, revealing that each of these dots on a map is composed of lifeways and histories. Whole Queens Catalog is a publication that takes inspiration from the Whole Earth Catalog, and in it, Desant gathered anecdotes, recipes, disaster survival techniques, and other practical wisdom from stewardship groups throughout Queens that she identified through the StuMap database. Our research also explores the network structure of the system of stewardship, including the way in which it is unevenly distributed across the landscape. Civic stewardship groups can connect with a broad constellation of stakeholders, and our survey asks groups who they work with to visualize the connections of ideas, partnerships, and resources. And over time, we think these relationships shape governance across sectors and influence both the policy agenda and the form of the city. But how do we show the strength of a network? Jody Lynn Ki Chow uses a patchwork dress, a picnic, and a participatory performance, each of these forms showing the, the way in which the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. She created a series of participatory picnic performances that set up space for the public to have conversations. Inspired by her grandmother, she sews together vinyl tablecloths, creating dresses that double as picnic blankets. And this performance mounted during the exhibit included food justice groups from across the five boroughs who she identified through the SUMAP database. The exhibition also explored the ways in which stewards adapt to change and are actively involved in envisioning and enacting new worlds. As part of disturbance and recovery cycles, stewards can help support communities and landscapes through environmental action by being flexible, adaptive in their response and programs. And this pattern has been repeated over time in New York City with stewardship groups forming in response to the fiscal crisis, September 11th, Hurricane Sandy, and now COVID-19. Julia Oldham's photographic collage series presents an amalgamated vision of New York City's future, especially with regard to climate change. During her field station residency, she used the StuMap database to connect with scientists, park rangers, gardeners, beekeepers, educators, and volunteers, and ask them to share their visions of the future. Oldham collected projections ranging from the utopian to the less optimistic and used these narratives as fodder for the constructed photographic depictions like you see here. So through this quick walkthrough, I've attempted to show how we created an exhibition that aimed to foster exchanges among stewards, scientists, land managers, artists, and educators, and by sharing stories across cultures and geographies. I believe that storytelling, artistic intervention, and map making can be used to strengthen our relationships of care between each other and to place, and thereby inspire, enliven, and broaden the field of natural resources management. So I'll close on an optimistic note in dark times. <laughs> I believe that care matters and is not finite. If we can see it more clearly, share it, and learn from it, then perhaps we can grow it. So thanks to all my collaborators, it takes a village. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to suggest um, that we take a minute right now. These are four powerful presentations, I think, of zombie ideas and how might we might respond. And I don't know about you, but I'm often I don't want to write in the chat because I don't want to miss something I'm hearing too. So I'm going to give everyone a minute to just absorb what they've just heard. And if you have questions, put them in the chat. 
or jot them down on your piece of paper so that you can ask them or listen. But let's just take a minute and absorb all of those thoughts and fill up that chat box. All right, deep breath. So I'm gonna start um, with a question actually that came out of the chat box, but it was something I was thinking of as well, which um, I purposely, and I think Denise did to some extent as well, did not start with here's how you absolutely define a zombie idea, but I think it's a powerful idea. So according to the um, Merriam-Webster, one of the definitions of the zombie idea is a supernatural power that according to voodoo belief may enter into and reanimate a dead body. And I think if you, oh, Denise is muted. Oh, and one of the interesting things about that particular, and there are many, and I'll go to another definition in a minute, is that I think we often treat knowledge about design practice as if it were a dead body, as if it were not a living, changing, constantly growing body, that it wasn't a dynamic piece that needs to be constantly recalculated and we understood and we read. Um, and that instead we actually allow this sort of tradition um, or these ways of thinking of, of assuming um, control of our body of knowledge. On the other hand, something probably people are more familiar with and um, where I saw somebody wrote it. Uh, yeah, Julia noted that um, Paul Krugman has talked about a zombie idea as a view that's been thoroughly refuted by a mountain of empirical evidence, but nonetheless refuses to die, being continually reanimated by our deeply held beliefs. They abound in our culture, nibbling away at the brains of their victims. Um, and again, it's sort of this idea that these are the ideas that keep shaping um, our practice Sometimes we're aware of them. And, and I think in the four talks, one of the things that came forward is sometimes we're not aware. And I think of um, when, when we heard Andrea talk about the electric grid and sort of realizing in the end that the issue was the electric grid, not all of the ways that we've tried to work around that, or that it's, it's a much bigger issue than invasive plants about native and non-native. So I wonder if the first question going back to the four of you was, how does thinking about a zombie idea or thinking about an idea that we have to challenge, do something for you in your work versus just going out and saying, I'm gonna do better, right? Which is so often we sort of, we don't wanna critique what we're critiquing, we just wanna do differently. But I think there's a power to naming that which we are challenging. So I don't know if any of you, yeah, Lindsay. Yeah, I can start. Uh, I, I struggled with the framing of killing an idea or a zombie idea, and Denise knows that. I more often have used the term sort of like a double-edged sword to talk about ecosystem services because we all know that ecosystems and nature has value, and we want it to be valued in decision-making arenas and contexts, and that's where it has been so powerfully leveraged. Like you know, if, if we need to invest in, in things from firehouses to schools to trees, what are the widgets by which we are going to compare value? I mean, that's what money is. It's a way of comparing and exchanging things. So I get it. It's been powerful. It's been powerfully leveraged by decision makers, by scientists, by activists, by neighbors who want to say, don't cut down my tree. It matters to me. But at the same time, everything that it leaves on the cutting room floor like that we cannot or maybe should not quantify like some of the socio-cultural dimensions 
and the spiritual dimensions of a, of a sacred grove, I think are, might be some of the most important things for, for forging a new way forward and making new decisions. So I really do feel it's this, it's this double-edged sword, it's, it's hegemonic, it's sort of everywhere. If you're in this space, you have to kind of play the game. So how do you play the game? And then also sort of blow it up. There's a lot of work to sort of um, refine algorithms and tweak black boxes and try and count and um, put indicators on more and more of the cultural services. And I feel like we're sort of chasing diminishing returns there. Um, and so that's where I wanted to, to set forth a different way, but you know, it's also still still out there in the ether. So that's just some starting thoughts. Right, but, but I think a really good point that sometimes we have to challenge even that which is productive in order to change it. Yeah. yeah other thoughts from others? I can, I can say that I changed my zombie idea last minute. Uh, <laughs> A couple of days ago, I sent an abstract with the zombie idea that um, we automatically assume that a renewable energy transition will be a just transition. Um, but you know that actually is is a reality in terms of how environmental justice coalitions are really um, working to change policy. You know, there's been really ambitious, great local and state policy in in New York. So. That's no longer really a zombie idea. It's it's been you know there's a realization that yes the green new deal, you know all of our environmental policies have to be aligned with uh, social priorities. Um, so then I realized it was actually this you know the elephant in the room which is the grid, um, but more than just the physical infrastructure, it's the complexity of of governance of relations of regulations. Um, that is really kind of prohibiting uh, vast change or, or any change that would be kind of would disrupt the complexity in a way like we're trying to add more complexity to to solve the problem yeah it, it also it um i think it helps to understand the depth and breadth and scale of the of what we're up against it's so much easier to imagine that it's a thin project. It's a matter of tweaking um, rather than of actually upending. Uh, it was certainly around native and invasive and ecology and culture plays a role. So I wonder if Sierra or Amy want to talk about that in terms of your work. And I'm also thinking about the role of naming that which you are critiquing, of naming the, the thinking that you're trying to change as a way of naming your own risk taking, of, of being accountable for the risk you're taking to get out there and say or do differently. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a difference between kind of to Lindsay's point, killing an idea versus challenging an idea. But I think that it has more traction to think about killing an idea as we're as we're pushing for paradigm shifts you know so even in, if, if in reality we're challenging and not killing i think it's important to um as you say uh like name what it is that you're challenging um it makes it more powerful i've been doing a lot of talks recently um with people in the mexico and mexico city government about informal settlements and you end up looking bad in the environmental world if you say anything about you know, working with informal settlements. Um, so I become like an anti-nature and I'm really pro-nature. And so you, you get pitted in these debates. You know, if Lindsay is anti-ecosystem services then she's not about valuing nature. Like, and I think that's what we're challenging. We're challenging these dichotomies that if you're pushing up against something you get put into a different camp about what your values are. And I think that's more important to change than the idea itself is like being broken into dichotomies. Yeah, which I think leads to Sierra's work and this idea that you're either into the ecology or you're into the culture. You're, mm -hmm. you're about people or you're about plants or you're about services. You can't be for some complex intersection of all of them. Sierra, do you wanna? 
Yeah, I was thinking a bit about, I mean, a lot of, all of our work, we're looking for some kind of systemic change, some shift. And sometimes it's very small, just a revaluate, a revaluing of a particular material. And sometimes it's much bigger, like getting a whole uh, country to own a history that it doesn't want to own. Um, and often we're, you know, I think we often think also about, are we going to break the system? Is it, do we have to break the system or can we iterate from within? Um, and I think we ask that question and sometimes it's helpful to just think about breaking the system to figure out what the powerful iterations might be because it's hard sometimes I think to, you know, break out. And so I think that was helpful here also. And I, I think for me, identifying ecology as in this case, um, inhibiting us from uncovering what this place should be was an, in, in, you know, just an incongruency that we, that I kind of felt as we were moving forward. Like how will people relate to this place if they don't relate to the plants, if they don't relate to these things, they might be doing something else that's great. And I think that's what, in this particular case, the idea of abundance, and I think it can apply to so much. It is that and, it is this thing and it is all these other things. And we think about it also when we're doing we're doing some, you know, massive agricultural food systems work, you know, it's, um, it's possible, I think, to have all of the systems of ecology and to add in all of the ethno botanical and all of these things. It's not, it's not just one or the other. And so seeking ways to make those things come together, I think is, is powerful. But I think if we forget about how we relate to things through our memory, through our culture, then that link to that which is ecological, which we need to value the most is broken because we, we don't have that day-to-day -day reminder of its importance to us, to our food systems, to like being able to survive into the future. You, you bring up an interesting, and, and it's an issue that I think we all think about a lot, which that idea of will we break the system? And, and then the, the, the equally important question of what's the worst thing that will happen if we break it? That what, what, what are the things that may need to be broken? When I think of how many of our systems are set up, for example, to support white supremacy, we probably need to break those systems. Uh, it's probably not just revamping them or, or reimagining them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and where do we need to make sure we don't break people's ability to survive? So we don't wanna break the systems right, that, that support people. So it, it's an interesting, and along that, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about agency and vulnerability. So in these projects, who, who do we work with? Who are those, who has agency in changing, challenging, killing the zombie ideas or changing, challenging them? And who, who do we have to think about in terms of who's vulnerable, who may be put at risk without necessarily having having a choice in the matter or at least having having their own clear agency in that. And maybe just use your own projects to talk about that. I can start. Um, so I mentioned the environmental justice community is really at the forefront of pushing for energy uh, policy change. Um, and they're not just operating sort of at this uh, grassroots level as we sometimes um, conceive or, or kind of understand how, how communities advocate for themselves. They're, they're at the table with New York, um, the, the transmission authority, right? So they've over the past you know, decades have um, really kind of developed and refined channels for for engagement. Although they're you know they're still working within these these larger frameworks of centralized distribution, um, but I think they're definitely a model in terms of you know community activists having having a lot of agency um, and their you know uprose we act New York City Environmental Justice Alliance they're they're all operating within localized scales as well. Um, I think there's a need to develop coalitions across, you know, boundaries, definitely, because this is a national issue, right? It's not just for trying to solve the energy problem in New York City. It's not, it's not possible without 
addressing these these other you know regulatory complexities. Right. Right. I could build on that a little bit. Um, I also saw I'm having trouble keeping up with the chat and listening, but I oh, saw... don't worry, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Okay, cool. You can just um, listen did... and be brilliant. <laughs> well, I did see a question about the terminology of stewardship, and I wanted to expand on that because it does relate to agency. It was a very deliberate choice to acknowledge that people can take care of place and make claims on space or place without having ownership. And in our kind of more conventional natural resource management paradigm, there's a lot of more attention on the land manager, be they the public land manager, or the private land manager, that's urban, that's rural, that's everywhere. But there's this sort of third space of people, you know, making claims, including, you know, with their bodies and through their labor or through their activism when, when they don't own things. And we want to recognize and acknowledge that and sort of put that on the map. And what that looks like in New York City is often civic groups, be they informal community groups or sometimes formal nonprofits. However, there's a flip side to sort of following that to its logical conclusion. Like, I'm not over here just celebrating the civic and saying, there's no role for government here. And I think sometimes our work has been misinterpreted that way. That's why we focus so much on networks. It's, I'm not letting the state off the hook. I'm not saying voluntary labor can do it all. I'm saying um, it, it is a both and approach. It's truly environmental governance. And if we acknowledge that, then how can we make it more equitable? Um, because it's, it's not even across space. By mapping these civic claims, we can see the areas where there are more groups and where there are fewer groups. And that can inform an organizing strategy in places where there are fewer. And it's not just about number of groups, it's about how professionalized are they? Do they have staff? Do they have budgets? You know, one multi-million dollar NGO can make a lot more claims on space than, you know, a handful of neighbors and a shovel. So what can they learn from each other across these networks? Um, and, and finally, you know, their, their, their position within the network matters. Sometimes you can have an incredibly outsized influence even being sort of a, a smaller group, whether it's because um, you've got a number of folks in your coalition. That's what made me think of it, Andrea, when you're talking about coalitions across space. Um, so sometimes a neighborhood group can really rise up and have an outsized influence because they've, they've got a platform, they've got a network of followers. And so the more we can kind of understand that structure and surface it, I think the better we can work to, to build equity around it. And, you know, I really commend sort of equity lenses that look at things like what's the distance to a park, like thinking about access to biophysical resources through an equity lens. We need to do the same thing with our social infrastructure. What's your access to like neighborhood levers of power and how can we make those more equitable? Right, interesting. See, so, Amy, and I'm, I'm thinking about cultural pieces, but I'm thinking about stories. Stories allow a different kind of agency. I wonder if either one of you want to talk, think about agency in, in your own work. Um, yeah, I, I cited an, an article in, in my presentation that we were looking at like narratives. I mean, we call them narratives or discourses in different groups of people. And that's also what my students work has been doing um, about informality and about water risks specifically. Um, and informality is interesting because when you ask like who's responsible or who who really has agency in the urbanization the illegal illegal urbanization of conservation land everyone sort of points their finger you know like the cartoon and everyone's fingers are pointing no it's the local government no it's the city government no it's the people they're the problem because they know better they know they're illegal and they're doing it anyway um and so i i think that that's it's it's important to reflect on responsibility and agency because really everyone in the equation has agency um, but only some people are vulnerable in that equation right and there, there are, everyone has their own interests and you know informal networks and processes are very formalized and there are people that are gaining from that there are people distributing services informally that's like the kind of boss of the block that 
you know, in exchange for tips, we'll get you more water. I mean, there's all the processes that we observe in formal networks are also an informal network. So it's kind of the joke that informality is just as formal. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that that it's interesting that you talk about agency with vulnerability because um, I think that you can look at different dimensions of power, you know, within how people are exhibiting their agency and and see different levels of vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. Sierra, I don't, I don't, I don't think what I'm what I have to add is anything new. And I think you know the way that you, everyone else on this panel is doing it is so tremendous. But you know, looking at the kind of spectrum of engagement from marginalized to tokenized to like empowered and and community led. Um, and I, I think that in, you know, from the design discipline and, and also the partners that we work with at times, you know, there's still so much trepidation about push, allowing, bringing in, giving voice to people in the community who know best what it is that they need and want. And I, you know, I, that's what I think we're trying to figure out. And there are so many great designers, you know, I think pushing that boundary and figuring out how do you hire community experts who know who to ask to tell their story, who know where the stories are, are, are dwelling in the community and, and that we can't access as, as outsiders. And, and how do we you know, get everyone to a level of comfort where, where we can provide that agency, we can not provide it, it's not even you know, to, to honor that, that, that agency. Um, and but but have a level of comfort, and I think you know particularly in municipalities, um, not all. Um, there's some that are that are really able to kind of see how powerful that is when it does happen. How different the ownership is that everybody else is talking about when people are deciding what it is that they they are able or want to have in their community. It's it's tremendous and. Anyway, that's all I have to offer. I don't think it's that different than <laughs> what everyone no, else is. I, no, I think it's, and, and I, I actually think the nuances of, of these discussions are really important, which leads to, to the question I wanna ask you, and then I'm gonna start pulling from the terrific questions on the chat. Um, talk a little bit about, um, I guess it's the process of realizing the kinds of ideas that you're trying to challenge, the zombie things that you're trying to kill or the um, ideas that you're trying to turn inside out. And partly I'm thinking, Andrea, your, maybe your process, partly it was putting together this talk and realizing it was the electric grid, not, not the other piece. But, but I'm thinking in each one of you, you talked about a process of practicing in a certain way and realizing you weren't comfortable and so talk a little bit more about how you go through that process and how you've come to a place where you can now name name the idea that you're trying to turn on its head. Because I think, especially as a teacher, I think it's the it's the, one of the hardest things for students to imagine is, is being able to turn something. They either think it's really easy and they're just gonna go out and do it differently and they realize that's hard. Um, or they just can't imagine. It's like, well, that was what I was taught. How, how do I challenge that? So how did you go? And a Andrea, I'm curious, because you talked about actually having that, sort of talking it through, using words, practice, discourse, play. Um, a challenge for me in this research is, is working through all the binaries within strategies for you know, thinking about energy transitions. That's from you know centralization, decentralization. Um, whatever emerges is going to be a combination um, of of ownership and governance, etc. Um, another binary is the you know renewable, non-renewable, um, and I'm trying to to convey the complexity, you know, rather than just like say, okay, if we can you know convert to renewables, everything's going to be fine. That's I'm trying to confront that idea. Um, because I think in, especially in the design discipline, there's, okay, let's put solar panels on all, all the buildings. Um, so in, in my, you know, thinking about how we're organizing, you know, how these community solar networks 
are um, operating and being deployed, I feel like there's a, I, I have a bit of a re reticence for kind of proposing this technology. Um, so I'm really trying to kind of ground this thinking with um, dissecting the, the current system, you know, and then that's been growing and building for, you know, over a hundred years. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's taking some time. Um, and then I'm also really interested in, you know, new, new frameworks of how do we think about renewables outside of this binary? So there's, um, you know, how do we, how do we compare renewables with non-renewables without bringing up jobs, right? So like if renewables are competing with fossil fuels, we have to talk about jobs. But if we're thinking about, you know, uniting like feminist post-work thinking with energy planning, then maybe we can reconceive of what work will look like. Um, and we even, you know, now with working from home, their, their one benefit has been a, a reduction in the peak demand. So you don't see, not, you know, everyone's not coming home at five or 6 p.m. and turning on their, you know, their TVs. So you already start to see some, some change happening just with these, you know, well, with this massive shift that we're all living, living through. <laughs> Amy, I'm curious how you went from everyone doing this to begin, beginning to pull that apart and understand the players and, and how you might go in and, and begin to change their relationships to one another. Well, this is, this is a personal battle, which is why I started with my invasive plant battle. This is a personal battle of like um, sort of as as we've been talking about, is loving nature and wanting to protect nature and believing in having a protected area of over half of Mexico City's land area. I mean, I find that amazing that they have the foresight and actually um, one of the people involved in that is the current mayor of the city. Um, so like, I'm not, I'm not against that, um, but it, it, it does feel, I always feel a bit of discomfort with the, with the discussions around um, informal settlements. Like it, it felt, and this is how I started connecting it for this talk, it felt really similar to my experiences with invasive plants. It's like, we need to get rid of these people. They're not supposed to be here. And sometimes they do. Sometimes they go and they like bulldoze, sometimes they don't. But a lot of these settlements have been there for 30 years and no land title, no, no like grid services. So it just, something doesn't feel right about that. It doesn't feel like, an, and it just, it just has a sort of stability, like it plateaued into everyone sort of gets a little bit of, of what they need. And so we're just gonna leave it alone mm -hmm. um, until people go and protest and anyway. But I, you know, I, I think that there's just moments where it doesn't feel right. Um, and, it sort of feels like we're going up a up a tread. Uh, what's the expression? Sort of like on, up against the current, <laughs> you up, know, up, something up, up a creek without a paddle. Yeah. <laughs> something like we're we're moving right. against yeah. the grain. Against, yeah, you know? grain. Yeah. No. Um, not that we have to not question anything and just go with the grain. Like, oh, everyone's there. They just go ahead. Everyone can construct whatever they want. I mean, it's it's sort of like what someone wrote in the chat about being nuanced. You know, I mean, it's yeah. not one or the other. It's not. Let's just pave the conservation area, but right. we have a particular socio-political situations that lead to these outcomes that we're seeing and we have to like stop and reevaluate. Um, and for students, I think it's interesting that you say this about students. I think it's so important to be able to present examples, which means someone has to like push a paradigm somewhere at some, some point. And usually it's like, there's this example from Denmark which people in Mexico City are like, it's always Denmark and Sweden that has, you know, we, we have nothing yeah. in common right. with these places. But, you know, just trying to like start to imagine different kinds of realities. These examples that I was talking about with um, informal settlements come from Indonesia and Thailand. Um, and so trying to find the little sparks where yeah. we're yeah. shifting paradigms, you know? Well, it's an interesting because when you say that, I 
communities often challenge paradigms without necessarily setting out to do that. The, the story I always think of is in New York City, the late 19th century as the small parks were being developed. A lot of the immigrant communities would then use those public spaces in the ways that they imagine public space should be used. That was not how the New York City Park Department. And so there was this constant battle about who got to determine. And um, in some way, the New York City Parks Department won in the end because they had more power. But actually in another way, other practices came in and we started to think about parks. So I actually think there are often examples that we don't necessarily recognize as challenging paradigms, but people are doing those pieces. Sierra, I think of your work and getting involved with communities and thinking, I don't know that very many communities sit down and say, oh, we have a cultural idea of ecology, or we have you know, a cultural story to tell about ecology in those words. Um, but clearly you're able to elicit that out. I'm wondering a little bit about how you do that. I mean, I think that's what I was presenting on is, I, I think we're, the discomfort that Amy was talking about is certainly there. Like, uh, and I think it's, I think we're pretty good at knowing where our discipline ends and where, I don't know, engineering starts some, you know, to some extent. I think we're less good at knowing where our expertise ends when it comes to the knowledge that can actually infuse a place with the things that make it um, part of the community that it's meant to be a part of. Um, and, and so I think, you know, reaching those moments where we know we don't know and then figuring out what questions to ask. And that, I mean, I think, you know, exactly what I was showing It's in that case, it isn't, and then there, I think, you know, I think there are, you know, more and more creative and interesting and direct and useful ways of doing it. But even just so simply as, you know, beginning to ask the questions and acknowledging that there is other expertise out there, even in the things that we think we know the best and knowing to uncover, like even just asking to begin to figure out how to uncover it. And it's, you know, the even fig figuring out how to frame the questions in such a way that we're not leading the answers um, or, you know, how to spend time with people so that those things come of their own. You know, sometimes it just takes time um, to, to allow those stories to surface. Uh, but I, I can't say that yeah, I'm expert on it yet, but I do totally relate to this idea of like knowing when something's not right, when you're applying a solution that doesn't fit, when, when there's a kind of discomfort about that disjoint. And it's not about the design piece, it's about um, having certainty of the knowledge that you're using um, to, to, to guide that design. And there are a lot of things we can have certainty about, but, but then they're knowing which ones we can't. Yeah, um, which leads to actually a question from the chat, which is, as I listen to all of you, in some way, you've made issues that we hoped were fairly simple um, ecosystem services. If we measure that, then we can argue for X number of trees done. Um, and we've added complexity. But could we think about that the complexity is actually because we have to deal with um, sustaining centralized power, but also sustaining this idea that there are universal answers, a universal knowledge, rather than very localized. Uh, each one of you talked about a localization of knowledge, which is, again, I would argue that is a paradigm that, that we have yet to really grapple with, which is when is knowledge, I, I really dislike the working word universal, but um, generally applicable and, and when do we localize? So is complexity really sustaining centralized power in this idea of universal? It, could it, well, let me just leave it at that and let you run with that one. Lindsay, uh, oh, go ahead, Andrea. Uh, no, I go, please. Yeah. I was going to put Lindsay on the on the. I was just going to say yes. So I was just going to respond yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. no. Well done, John. Check that no. Well, I had some thoughts to your prior question that sort okay. of tangentially yeah. answer this, and um, 
again, in my own struggling with the notion of a zombie idea, maybe there's something revealing in there. I mean, first of all, I think maybe of the panel, oh, I don't know you all that well, but I'm, I'm pretty much an incrementalist and you might even in some cases call me a bureaucrat. <laughs> and I study um, policymaking and governance. So I'm really interested in the messy and incremental and flawed ways in which policy change happens. So it's very hard to sit on the side of that and, and make like sweeping paradigm smashing like critique. Well, I mean, it's both easy and hard depending on your focal length. So I also found in our work on stewardship, like when, you, when you're set up to write a research paper, you're supposed to be like, here's the problem. You start from the problem statement. And I often found that we're sort of talking about a solution in search of a problem because these, this civic action is very um, multivalent. It's not responding to just one thing. It's, you know, um, local community action, environmental justice, like solar, food justice, like the groups are as diverse as the ecosystem um, in New York. So we're essentially studying um, a phenomenon rather than um, a framework and doing a lot of just trying to visualize and celebrate the possible. That's sort of the mode I'm normally in. And it took me spending some time in this space of thinking about biocultural stewardship and the link I put in the chat, kind of getting outside of my like, well, what is New York City culture, but at least the, the, the space that I know here and spending time talking with Heather McMillan and folks from Hawaii who were studying Native Hawaiian worldviews and epistemologies to really bring forward um, the ways in which the ecosystem services framework it, it is so fundamentally limited. So I had to kind of get outside of my own little local sphere to sort of see that critique and then see the way in which um, the work we're doing on celebrating stewards and visualizing them and understanding their cultures of care, you know, even here, you don't, you don't have to go somewhere else, could also be challenging to that sort of dominant um, framework. So I guess my answer is also yes. I think yeah. local ecological knowledge really matters. Um, and we need to build more of these kind of cross-cultural conversations to understand both the similarities. Somebody asked a question about things that are universal. I too struggle with universal, but there are um, some universal symbols, some touchstones, some icons in many cultures, and then the things that are really, really unique to, to place and to people. So um, that's sort of where I'm at with that. Anybody else wanna relate to that, think about Complexity, simplicity, localized universals. Well, I mean, I, I had been thinking about this during the talks, like how does something become entrenched in a path dependency? Like, what is it that makes it universal? You know, like there's some ease uh, of categorizing, which means that complexity and localization and nuancing is actually inefficient, you know, it like takes more time. This, I, the storytelling that Sierra talked about, like that takes a lot of time. Qualitative narrative work that where you're connecting with communities, you know what I mean? Lindsay, how long did you say you've been doing this? 18 years, 18 years, like, okay. Half your life you have been understanding stewardship in New York City, it's not efficient. It is not something that's like, you know, a bureaucrat's love, Lindsay, which or is- I'm just really bad at it. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I don't think so. No, it's, 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 it's complex. I mean, you show these grids of, you know, the webs, which I've seen evolve, by the way, that's like a different version than I saw 10 years ago of, of you know, like who is doing what. And that's not from a bureaucratic and like decision-making angle, a very efficient way to do things. You know, we like the grid, we like centralized, it makes it easier, right? And so when we start to be nuanced and localized, that really hits up against like our, our need for streamlined path dependent efficiencies. Um, so I don't know how to break that. I mean, I, I kind of think that in some ways, as you mentioned, you know, people, kind of rise up and break it in different places. And, and that's where the agency becomes so powerful. 
um, like understanding that we have power as people that we're not just like, you know, passive users of the grid. We're not just, you know, passive street ob tree observers, but we're actually active in this and how to trigger that. It also goes back to your point about like students and discussions and these kind of like, you know, um, these, these ways of getting people together to sort of push against what we believe is, is solidified, that we can't break these dependencies. I'll just add a super pragmatic spin to that, which is um, it definitely takes more time and it definitely costs more money, therefore. Uh, and I think part of the reason that we're a nonprofit is that either we have mission alignment with the partners that we're working with, and so they're willing to, to go that extra mile because they see the value in it, because the communities they're serving deserve that value and they'll get better, they'll get a better output and they'll be more engaged with it. Um, or for those that can't afford that extra bit, then we can get philanthropic funding to fill it in. But it's definitely, at, it's not, you know, we have a little graph that shows this curve and like, you know, what is normally accounted for in the work that we do and all of this stuff and the time that it takes is not accounted for. And I think even within the length of a design project, it's really hard to get there. <laughs> um, so 18 years is probably more like it working in one place. I mean, I think that's another reason why our office, you know, commit to working in, in the places where we open for really long time because it takes that time to get to know the community and everybody in it and you know all of the materials that they use to build and you know all of that stuff it just takes a long time. You know it's I'll just say this quickly as a historian um, in the 19th and early 20th century when firms took on projects the assumption was you would be with it for 20 or 30 years. Um, that is a very um, late 20th century idea that time is money and therefore, you know, how quickly you can get in and out of a job is it's somehow equated to quality. So if there were a paradigm shift I would want to do, it would that piece that, that more time and therefore more money is somehow not efficient or not appropriate or just for wealthy communities. Um, but that's that's a whole. Um, there's a really good question here that I think segues right from this. Um, we're hearing that government and nonprofits are bound together, um, which distributes agency to some extent. But is it ultimately uncivic? Private sector is not always wearing a white hat. Um, citizens in white hats are burdened with paying for the necessities. How do we negotiate this? What what are the negotiations? What are the relationships? Especially you as designers. And, and again, I'm thinking of people particularly who are working in between government, nonprofit communities. You know, we're often the ones facilitating those relationships. What is your agency in that? And what are you looking to do? And, and how might, I, I think an embedded question is that could we, could we renegotiate that so it's not a this or that or, you know, who gets to be on top? It's sort of, to me, the the same thing as challenging the duality of our English language, that everything is big or small, wet or dry, that could we, it's government or it's nonprofit, it's community or it's, could we renegotiate those? And, and I think each one of you is actually doing that. So curious to have you talk a little bit about that. Sorry, can you just say, what was the part about the white hats? I missed that part of the question and it seemed important. <laughs> Private sector is not always wearing a white hat. So basically, how are the citizens um, in white hats who actually end up paying for all of these? Um, so the, the, the citizen, the community member who's you know, doing this work, paying for it, taxes, et cetera, living in the communities. I, I would argue they pay for it in lots of different ways, right? because it's the life they live. Um, how, how do we renegotiate? Well, um, I think 
are, are, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but I guess I'll get, take another crack at it if I didn't answer that before. Um, <clears throat> I think we absolutely have a response, the state absolutely has a responsibility to provide crucial public infrastructures, you know, full stop. And I think we, <laughs> we need like a massive overhaul to our, to our tax structure to like do that better. <laughs> Set that aside. Um, in addition, um, I think there is this whole amazing constellation of civic actors that are out there that need to be better understood, seen, valued, connected. You know, some of them are working in, in silos, like pretty disconnected from resource flows. Some of them are um, completely kind of plugged into the power structures. And it's not you know, decision making doesn't happen in this hierarchical way, like federal, state, county, municipal, you know, it, it, it is this network structure. And I think the better we can understand that, the more we can take solutions to build more equity. So an example is we have that pretty network diagram that Amy mentioned and I showed. And how can we understand who are, who are like really crucial brokers? Who are the civic groups that occupy a really important place in the network, be it for the flow of resources or for the flow of information and how can we best work with them in our governance arrangements to kind of harness their capabilities for good i guess and then to say are there whole swaths of communities that don't have those kinds of brokers and how can we kind of build them up and and better connect them and i think this you know maybe i'm so fully neoliberalized that my answer is sort of like yes both and but I mean, I just spent three hours this afternoon on a COVID and parks like budget equity hearing. And it's, you know, we're in, we're in another fiscal crisis right now. So if ever the government couldn't do it alone, I mean, we can't. And so we need um, fair and equitable and innovative solutions across all sectors just to even ensure like the basic maintenance of our public infrastructures set aside all of that, there's also like just an incredible amount of meaning making and empowerment that comes from civic leadership. That's not about the labor and the sort of, you know, capacity that civic groups are bringing to it. It's, it's making meaning in your place. It's expressing agency in your place. So what if you're unemployed, underemployed, and, you know, you take it upon yourself to sort of pick up trash on your block. I don't think you're being like, captured by the state there you know i think it's a more complicated relationship so you know, again, I guess i'm saying complexity but um i want to really understand the motivation of stewards and sort of meet them where they are and resource them to do what they do better when they want to i and that and that is powerful you know it's you're making me think i don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to read their the um american academy of arts and sciences just came out with a report called Our Common Purpose, um, Building and Strengthening Our Democracy. I think I have those words in the wrong order, but that's essentially what it is. And an interesting conversation I just sat in on was why is democracy in fact a design issue? And how are designers actually grappling with how do we enhance and gender strengthen democracy through design and, and it's everything from how do we actually design access to public places that's often how we think of it but they actually were talking about how do we how do we think of for example um, the right to vote as a design issue something that could design could actually come in and this is what I think of when I when I hear this question it's not just how do we get people to play into the system that's there, but how might we, in fact, create through design a different structure, an alternative structure, which I think brings us back to what, what do we want to either kill, change, alter, throw, throw under the bus, or just upend. Um, and I think it's an interesting, and I'll, I, I realize, Denise, nod to me, are we to 7.30 or to 8.00? 7.30? 7.30. Okay, so I need to be polite and recognize everyone's time. 
and realize I am over time. So um, terrific questions. I would just leave you each because Lindsay was so clear she was an incrementalist. I wonder if anybody wants to do a final piece on whether you see upending or challenging your zombie idea as something that will be done incrementally, catastrophically, or just by great leaps and bounds. Say one more right. time. It's that chat so, distracting so, me. <laughs> no, I know there's a lot of good stuff. Um, so as you think about challenging or getting changing your paradigm, do you see it changing incrementally, catastrophically, or by positive, productive leaps and bounds? I'm just going to jump in and say, I think it, it just it kind of was adding on to your prior question and how we manage that as an organization that, you know, has to sustain itself in some way. And I think it's at one in three, so it's incremental and it's leaps and bounds. And so I think- No catastrophes. As, as much as possible, we get them, but <laughs> um, I think it's making the new model. And that's why I love that idea of designing democracy. And I was thinking, oh my God, if design could supplant privatization and business as the solution to everything, things would be amazing. Like that would just be such a nice new era to live in. Yeah. Um, but I think the approach that we take is that to refit, retool the system or the prevailing model we have to find the partner, the place, the project um, that is wanting to make that incremental change and seek it out. So we, it's like vetting our partners, either find, seeking out our partners by finding thought leaders who didn't know they needed design and saying, look, we think this is a design thing. What do you think? Let's get money and figure out how to do it. Um, or, you know, find, you know, when partners come to us, kind of having a conversation until we get to the understanding that all of the things that we think are worthwhile are worthwhile. And that means that we can create a new model. And if we create that new model, then all the other fearful entities that are, you know, challenged by the, the um, insecurity or the um, not knowing the discomfort of trying something new have something that they can follow on. And so it's, to, for, I think for me, for us, it's about trying to get to a new model that then can influence, hopefully shift policy, build a new hospital that's so different that we get to write the, the standards and guidelines for hospitals. Andrea, do you think, can we, can we change the electric grid without a catastrophe or do we need the catastrophe, which we may get any minute now, so. Well, California is changing their grid with a catastrophe as well as Puerto Rico yeah. is moving in that direction. Um, so at, at the scale of the country, I think it's gonna take a cascade of catastrophes over a long duration. Um, and until that point, we're gonna continue to make you know, easy, quick fixes. Um, but I think the community groups have been you know, following the incremental approach, which you know, has seen some success, like the, the, the law to, to reduce NOx emissions is huge. Um, but in terms of what an alternative will look like, um, we need, I think, you know, similar to what, what people are talking about in terms of stewardship, we need, a, we need to leverage um, kind of these interactions between city policy and, and community groups. We need to leverage the power of community groups um, more to really think about how, how can we scale these models without having you know, an exceptional organization like Uprose, you know, using so many time um, and you know so many resources, right, to 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 develop this project, which has required collaboration with like you know five city agency city agencies. So it's kind of addressing the complexity of um, the electric grid, but also the complexity of how do we move projects, you know, through in the city. Amy, do you want to wrap up with anything? Um, yeah, I mean, I sort of move in two directions. I really like having Lindsay as a friend because she's like often very optimistic. Um, and I'm actually, I can be very pessimistic. Um, 
like I think that the housing issue, which is really turns into a housing issue, is going to get worse as inequality gets worse, right? And um, you know, we sort of gasp at informal settlements in um, in the global south, and then we come back to California, where there's is it forty thousand homeless people? So it's like, what's worse, you know, like not having regular access to water, but everyone sort of leaves you alone as you have um, no title or literally being like a non entity, like not even seen um, by the state. Um, although California is trying to push through that with different kinds of initiatives. So, um, you know, who, who is allowed to like formally exist in the world? I think, you know, it's, it's kind of going to get worse or I think it's going to move faster than the initiatives to um, help it um, so I, that's kind of pessimistic. I don't want to end on, on such a pessimistic note. I don't think it's impossible to work through, um, but I think we need to move faster, especially in the face of climate change and climate refugees. And I mean, it's just, we're going to have a lot of upheaval um, with housing. And so we have to find innovative ways of, of providing housing to more people. Brilliant. And I'm going to turn it over. Thank you guys to Denise to wrap us up and apologize to people for keeping us over, but these were terrific answers and discussions. I, I'm not gonna keep anybody any length of time. I just wanna thank all of the, the speakers and Thaisa for what was an amazing launch to this series. I'm feeling really good since we got whacked by COVID last spring and had our whole symposium canceled literally days before uh, the, the college locked down. So uh, this is great that we're able to recover this and these conversations are, are wonderful to hear and we do plan to elaborate on them. We're uh, putting together uh, thoughts for a publication and we're, uh, we hope that you'll all join us for the next one next Thursday, same, same time. And uh, I think the links are out there. So thank you again to all the speakers and to everyone who asked the question uh, in the chat. And everybody who's sitting there with a question and they didn't get to ask it, thank you very much. And hopefully we'll hear from you next time if we didn't get to it this time. Have a good night and a great week. Bye. Thank you.